better hey, calm down. Fuck you. And your oh, fucking man, microphone, bitch. You're not, you're not even from this country. I'm, no, he I'm, I'm not no, from no, this country. Sure. Woo woo! Woo woo! This is Unplanned America, where you're invited to join Parv, Nick, and me, Gonzo, as we flee Australia road trip around the land of the free in search of the weird, wonderful, mysterious, and sometimes scary, unplanned side of America. This episode is all about family. From the juggalos we encounter in Southern Illinois to the gay ballroom houses of New York City, we discover that family can be found in the most unlikely of circumstances. When they go home and they're living their lives, people are like, you're a dork listening to that shit, you know? To be out here in the middle of nowhere and to be around all these people that have the same interests you do, it just makes it wonderful. It's like, thank God I'm not alone. A Juggalo is a follower of a rap group called the Insane Clown Posse, known for its violent lyrics. Now, Juggalos say it's a way of life. Criminologists call it dangerous. Authorities have classified Juggalos as a gang in Utah and Arizona, as well as in portions of Pennsylvania and California. Rumors of violent, murderous Juggalos and a recent gang classification from the FBI had us wondering whether we were really cut out for the gathering in southern Illinois. Nick's ingenuity ensured that at least upon arrival, we'd have some cool beers to calm our nerves. I am advancing my design for my Unplanned America AC beer cooler, which I think is suitable for such an event. One can, two cans. And then it was time to meet the Juggalo family. We are now at the gathering of the Juggalos. Whoop, 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 whoop. We're at the gathering of the jugglers. We're about to witness a blind roller skate battle with boxing gloves. On the count of three, y'all ready for this? Somebody Three, up the two, one, fight! Bring them in! We were definitely out of our element, and it seemed hard to reconcile the chance of family with the behaviour we were witnessing. The police don't come in here, they're not allowed to come in here. There's people with signs saying morphine, magic mushrooms, whatever you want. Look at the size of this fucking joint. Whoop, whoop, whoop. So behind us is the controversial drug bridge where everyone goes to get their drugs. You can get any drug apparently that you want. You can get acid, mushrooms, uh, molly, which is MDMA. Panadols. Panadols, if you've got a headache. Apparently, maybe even heroin, but that is an unconfirmed rumour at this That's juncture. That's the only drug we haven't seen here yet. Well, heroin, it's not in fashion at the moment, is it? Nah. It'll come back. It's The 90s are coming back in, so yeah, I it's imagine it's retro. Come back. It'll, it'll come back. Play drugs, play hugs. And there was a whole lot more than drugs on offer at the gathering. Mum, please change channels. Don't tell the organisers, but I'd probably come here for free and not even get paid. Broadcasting live from the yep. Dr. Fago, <laughs> Turkey Tonic. Charles, what is it? These hats are made with 316 stainless steel, sharp as a tack. He just shaved his arm with the hatchet that he's carrying around. There are some, there are some really fucked up juggalos out there. I mean, there are some really fucked up juggalos with places like here. A lot of, I've seen three or four people get carried out. You, if you don't know what what your limit is, you find it here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What up, boys? Do you mind if we have like a quick chat with you guys for Australian TV? We were just uh, interviewing a couple of juggalettes and a juggalo, having a nice grand old chat. We respect one another. We treat each other like equals. Yeah. So we're gathering, um, like. 
Then out of a cubicle rolled a big fat fuck. He's like, stop filming, stop filming. <laughs> hey, you better hey, calm down. Fuck you. In your oh, fucking hey, microphone, on, bitch. So then the square off began. So these like, two guys fucking started facing each other. Everyone's crowding around. The crowd started building. Hey. You're not even from this country. I'm, he does, he does I'm, I'm not from this country. Fat guy pushed that in. Fat guy put you're, you're, you're the fat guy. He's the fat guy. I'm not the fat guy. He came at me, pushed me. Uh. And, then, and then the other guy's like, <laughs> And the fat goes. guy, which shouldn't be me, <laughs> fucking hit the ground. Woo woo! Woo woo! Okay, we're done, but he just swung on me, bro. We were like, let's get out of here. And about five minutes later, 15 juggalos had stomped down towards us. The fat guy's crew wanted to see our footage. If a weapon had been used, all hell was about to break loose. I was trying to stop it the whole time, right before yeah, that, he was trying to fight him to get out. Thankfully, there was no weapon, and it never escalated. We managed to laugh it off, but it had been a pretty frightening experience. To be fair to the Juggalos, though, the fight had only begun when one of their own defended us. Hey. We're not even from this country. Okay. We were still unsure about the FBI's assertion that the Juggalos were a dangerous gang, so we decided to dig a little deeper. Woo -woo. Woo -woo. Tell us what it's about being a Juggalo, man. It's about family. Yeah. It's about the lifestyle. It's just, just look out for each other, get each other's back. And it's yeah. love no matter who you are, or how you look, or who you are. We don't judge. We accept you for who the fuck you are. We got yours back no matter who you are or what you do. We got you. Tattoo this the day I came up to the army. The day so you're in the army. You're in the army. Yes, sir. Are there many juggalos in the army? Um, or? There were seven of us juggalos with tattoos and shit, and they had separate because we were gang related. Yeah, right. Even in the army, we're considered a gang. The longer we spent at the gathering and the more time we spent with the juggalos, we couldn't help but feel they'd got a bad rap. To us, it seemed that they were just a group of guys and girls that had got together in the hope of finding people with similar beliefs. It means that I'm always going to have family to rely on that's not going to judge me, that's going to be down with me and fucking roll with me. And, and the fucking FBI and there were a gang shit. We are too unorganized to be a fucking gang. The most organized thing we do all year is make it to gathering. I mean, do we look organized? Do we look like we're going to yeah, harm anybody? Yeah. Most people here are too fucked up to do anything bad to each other. Some of you may not have had cousins, some of you may not have had brothers, some of you may not have had sisters, good friends that you've never had in your life. They're and you here. missed it, and you, but you have it right here. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter where you're from. You're from Australia? If you can make it, you know. Your family. Gathering of the mother effing juggalos. Whoa, whoa. Best time ever. Keep grinding. Same man, baby. We keep grinding. We keep grinding, ninjas. Whoop, whoop. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> we'd spent three days and nights at the gathering of the juggalos, and while there'd been the odd shocking moment, we'd been welcomed with open arms by this much maligned group. And now the time had come to speak to the band behind the entire movement. The insane clown posse. You've basically got this huge community which is based on you guys. Like, how does that feel? It doesn't really feel like the way you, you probably see it. Because we're just as amazed by juggalo culture as the juggalos are. We never planned this, this part of it. We never said, let there be juggalos. You know what I'm saying? The juggalo world created itself. The, the bond, the, the uh, camaraderie, is strictly magic. You guys made a big announcement that you're going to sue the FBI. We have to sue the FBI. Juggalos are so united and so passionate that the FBI it scares them. They, people fear what they don't understand. So they label it a gang. If you do a crime and you're about to do a week in jail, if you're in a gang, that'll turn into a month in jail. So if a juggalo gets out there peddling weed, then he goes to get sentenced. Just because he's a juggalo, he's going to do an extra three weeks. That's fucked up. That is the government's way of dictating what people can and can't wear, or what they can and can't listen to. Five years from now, when the rest of the world accepts it, that juggalos are a gang, it takes something so special, which juggalos are, and it shits all over it. 
Jesus says, you're nothing special. You're just a fucking gang. Anytime we're written about or talked about, we're dissed heavily hard, right? People that listen to our shit, juggalos, they go through shit just being a juggalo. People give them shit at their job, or their school, or whatever. It's not easy being a fan of the most hated band in the world. But when it's not just the music that they have in common, it's so many other things. I never had a mom, I never had a dad, you know. Most of us came from homes where it wasn't like a family, and we come here to replace that. Exactly. That's exactly it. Well, well. Really, anybody who's ever felt like they were outcast, or, you know, the downtrodden, you know, we're sad he's trash, and we're real sick of it, so we decided to band together, and we started a club, and we said what would be a neat name, Juggalos, and that's what it's all about. When they come here and they have all these people just like them, that are also into it. And you know you're not alone. It's like a sigh of relief beyond comprehension. With the gathering in our rear vision mirror, we were back on the road. Only four days earlier, we were headed into the great unknown. But any fears had disappeared when we were accepted into the Juggalo family upon arrival. We'd found a culture where everyone was accepted for who they were, regardless of how society at large had viewed them. And we couldn't help but feel that the FBI's gang label was unwarranted. It had been a hell of a four days that we weren't gonna forget anytime soon. And as we drove away, we'd already made plans to get back there for a family reunion. Tell everybody, if you're not here, in fact, fuck you, you're not here. So next time, bring your ass here and you can enjoy all of this. This is our paradise. Please come and join us. Gathering of the Juggalos. Whoop, whoop. In New York, you're forced to look at strangers in the train. You're forced to rub against people that you normally won't. And so that's why ballroom exists here because it's probably the only place that it really can be what it is. The next part of our unplanned journey across the USA took us to the heart of the Big Apple and headfirst into another example of a unique self-made American family, the voguing and ballroom scene of New York City. The epicenter of this world is a regular Monday club night at a place called Escalita, an event known as Vogue Nights. So that, of course, was where the boys and I headed. When we got there, the club was relatively quiet. It soon became apparent that those there were competitors warming up. The club filled up and judges assembled. Then, at around 1am, the competition began. The source of the night's music, DJ Mike Q, explained to us that the dancers were battling it out one-on-one -on -one for the honour of their respective dance houses, often named after the legendary fashion houses of Paris. Mike Q also outlined the different elements the Vogues were judged on in each ballroom walk-off. There's five and sometimes six elements with Vogue and dips. Catwalks. Duck walks, hands, spins, floor performance. Because all I'd seen was Madonna Vogue, you know, mm -hmm. and so I thought, and I knew that it was a more legit dance scene than just like putting your hands next to your face, but I didn't expect it to be as yeah. tough, you know? Yeah, and it's even like changed from what it was then till now. It's like more dramatic now. And then you have like a lot of the, the younger kids. So they, they change like the flavor of the Vogue and like a lot of the moves they come up with are, are their own. The night's proceedings were controlled by Kevin Jay-Z Prodigy of the House of Prodigy, who is known in the ballroom scene as a commentator. Well, commentating is basically like emceeing or rapping a host of a, any type of major event. Can I get a nice little hop, please? Let's go. I get kind of vulgar. I may recite poetry, but I may recite poetry as if I'm rapping it. Um, I may just say things that come off the top of my head. Get, 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 get,
Like if I would just want to say bitch or pussy or, or get out of my face, I'll just make it sound really nice. And how competitive does it get? It gets very intense. The cross-dressing ballroom scene in New York City dates as far back as the 30s. However, these balls were mostly the domain of white men and black participants were expected to whiten their faces. By the late 60s, however, the black gay community had grown the ball scene to heights unimagined by their white counterparts. We wanted to learn more. Luckily for us, our time coincided with one of the biggest events on the ballroom calendar, the House of Latex Ball, where we would learn there is a much more serious side to the whole scene. We had found ourselves smack bang in the middle of New York City's legendary underground voguing and ballroom scene, where young gay and transgender black and Latino men battled it out for the glory of their dance crews or houses. And we'd been invited to film at a charity event that really highlighted what this culture was all about. We're in the middle of New York City, in the middle of Manhattan, uh, at the 22nd annual House of Latex Ball. It's put on by the gay men's health crisis here in New York. And it's basically the epicenter of all things Vogue and Ballroom, which is the real reason that we're here. As we delve into that culture, we just had to be here and um, see what happens. Can we get some sound? Inside, we were blown away once again, this time by an insane fairy tale themed ball. Using the moves that Mike Q had explained to us, the competitors faced off in a series of different categories. These range from straight up runway walking to intense voguing and other more fantastical costume categories. As we saw how fiercely they defended the honour of their houses, we started to realise that maybe these organisations were more than just a team to these young people. Each house was headed up by older members of the scene, who took on the role of mothers and fathers in the Vogue family tree. Behind the evening spirit of celebration, there were much heavier realities faced by members of the Vogue and Boreham community. The evening was run by a charity organisation known as Gay Men's Health Crisis, and Krishna Stone was its head of community relations. And tonight, this is the 22nd annual House of Latex Ball. While it is about creativity and resiliency and amazing talents, it's also about stopping the spread of HIV. Young gay black men are disproportionately impacted by HIV in this country and globally. It's a historic issue around the meaningfulness of black people, transgender people, gay people. You're often thought of as somebody who is not really needed, and that's just really not the case. We need more role models, particularly for gay kids. They just don't have enough role models who that they can talk to, who can talk to them about the issues around relationships, about identity, about sex. Krishna thought that mainstream society and media didn't provide the role models that these young people needed to stay healthy and happy, trying to make their way in a country where they were basically the minority of the minority. Maybe some guidance was exactly what the mothers and fathers of their houses provided. We met the perfect man to answer our questions, legendary voguer Luna Khan, patriarch and overall father of the House of Khan. Can you tell us a little bit about your life story coming into this into this scene? I first started coming to the house and ball scene um, in, in 1988. I was about 17-ish. So I was automatically like intoxicated with this wonderful movement that people were doing. Most young gay people tend to draw or go to like the ball scene because it gives you that family that you're you don't have. Some have brilliant families who love them, but some, their family kicked them out because they're gay. And I was a kid in a house, now I'm a father of a house, so. So the difference between the mother and the father is that is the mother like a transgender person and the... Not necessarily because I was a mother once. A mother is just, an, is, a, is a title, so like you could be a mother of a house. Yeah. A mother is just, a, it's just because maybe there's already a father, so they need a mother. <laughs> okay, what has the house prodigy done for you? I feel like I would support. Just know that you have another family that you, that you can come to. I was one of those young people that was kind of dismissed and lost myself. My story begins, and it will always begin, um, at the age of 14, um, because I was, I was infected with HIV at the age of 14. I had my first sexual, sexual experience, and so what happened with that is 
I got HIV and that's that's what made my compassion for life and want to do more for people more vivid. To have been living this long with it, I think that it's a, a gift, but I still have a lot of work to do because I know life could be taken away like that. The GMAC was, which is Gay Men's Health Crisis, uh, was the first agency, the first service organization for HIV AIDS in the world. Most of my work is to provide a service to young people and make them feel like they are loved because a lot of us aren't. People just don't care. Like, we need to start loving each other and we need to like come together because at the end of the day, that's really what it all is about. It's about what you leave on earth, but how you touch people. I think that's what's nice about also Ballroom is that no matter what and what team you're a part of, we still embrace you. You say like sometimes they're kicked out, and the gay community kicked out of their family homes and stuff like that. Then they come here or just come to the ballroom scene and they've got, they get to have that feeling. You know, people that I usually don't get the same love and respect that anybody else would, they get that. They have people that are screaming their name in the name of love, you know? And then you have, you know, you have family and then you have competition and then you have, you know, if you win, you get the award. And, you know, and that will make anybody feel wanted, loved, all of that. Like, we all want to be somebody. We cannot just walk in the street every day with a costume on because we have a whole bunch of people judging us, you know, gay bashing us. Most of us come out to the ballroom scene to enjoy the night, have fun, you know, be ourselves. And also certain people, they only have this to come to because they don't have nothing. They lost family, shelter, everything. So this is like their, their highlight of their life. Their family may have dismissed them or society doesn't care about them. Somebody loves them. For that little moment, you are Madonna. You are the Beyonce's of the world. We all strive to be that for that moment. When I die and I'm, you know how they say life flashes before you, there's gonna be a whole bunch of ballroom moments because that's what it was. You know, my life is a flash of ballroom moments. And I think that that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I think, um, yeah. That's, per that's a perfect ending. We'd come to realise that the ballroom houses have played a vital family role for thousands of gay and transgender, black and Latino men, many of whom were cruelly kicked out of the families they were born into. Thanks to leaders like Luna and Krishna, as well as the scene as a whole, young people who face much more adversity than we would ever have to endure were given the love, acceptance and even a sense of self-pride that everybody deserves. After being welcomed with open arms by both the Juggalo family of Illinois and the Ballroom family of New York City, it was once again time for the Unplanned America family to hit the road.